Thank you very much to the Academy for asking me to speak. And I was going to tell you the story of an academic um, drug discovery project that I've been involved with over the years and use this to illustrate what an early phase cancer trialist does. And so it, it is very much a story. And Rubraca or Rucaparib was a collaboration between Cancer Research UK and Newcastle University that started back in the 1990s. And this drug is now licensed both in the US and in Europe. But to start really with the story, I was going to start in 2003 when I first met a man called Peter. At that time, he was a 43-year-old painter and decorator and the typical sort of patient I see in my phase one clinic. About that age, the median age of people I see is about 50-odd now. He had a teenage family, he had an inoperable tumour and no treatment options left. So he and his wife had come to discuss participating in a phase one study. His only other option is to have symptom control. This is a picture of his CT scan showing his large intra-abdominal tumour. It doesn't really matter what sort of cancer it is because phase one studies typically take in patients with any tumour type who have run out of treatment options. So he was prepared to take a drug where we weren't sure of the dose. We didn't know what the side effects might be and we didn't know if it was going to work. And many of us will be familiar with the classic stages of drug development, which are phase one, where you're working out dose, schedule, and looking at safety and exploring toxicity. Because in a cancer phase one, we, do, we would try and do, find dose in 30 to 50 patients and smaller numbers of patients in other disease areas. Phase two is your screening study for efficacy, and phase three are the big randomized pre-registration studies. But if you think about what cancer physicians are trying to do, both with radiotherapy and with systemic treatments, we're actually trying to kill human cells inside the human. So it's different to any other treatment area, you could argue. And one of the problems that causes for us is that you can't ask healthy volunteers to take cancer drugs. So we do our dose finding, even our early phase studies, in patients, not healthy volunteers. And Newcastle's a CRUK centre and ECMC where early phase trials, clinical pharmacology and drug discovery are our recognised areas of expertise. CRUK invests a huge amount of money in research. We're very privileged in cancer medicine. It has a number of centres, institutes, experimental cancer medicine centres. And you'll see um, the little triplet up in Newcastle is a CRUK centre, which I lead, an experimental cancer medicine centre, which I also lead, and an academic drug discovery unit. So that's what we do in Newcastle. We see about 700 patients in the situation that Peter was in each year who were interested in a phase one, recruiting across the north of England. This is the Scottish border here. And this is the swathe that we recruit into with the other big phase one centres in Manchester, sorry, Manchester and Glasgow, and small, slightly smaller centres in Edinburgh and Leeds, but patients are travelling. What I also always say um, to be partisan is we've got all the nice bits, and this is beautiful countryside um, that we're recruiting across. But to go back to the story and a little bit of science, a PARP inhibitor, Rucaparib is a PARP inhibitor, and PARP is polyADP ribose polymerase. It's an enzyme that we've got in the nucleus of all of our cells, apart from the neutrophils for some reason. And it's a molecular NIC sensor. We get thousands of little bits of DNA damage a day because of reactive oxygen species and things that happen. It's very important our DNA is kept um, in its pristine state. So there are DNA repair mechanisms. And PARP is an inactive enzyme which is activated by a DNA strand break. It binds to it and makes polymers of ADP ribose from NAD, hence its name. Those are negatively charged. They flex the break and signal it's there and allow the other DNA repair enzyme in. in. The PARP then hops off and it's a recycled enzyme. So it's really important. But in cancer medicine, radiotherapy and much of the chemotherapy we use works by... Um, damaging DNA in dividing cells, and the cancer cells use their DNA repair to overcome that. So the story of PARP inhibitors started actually in Brighton, not in the north of England, so I am being fair, with Sidney Sal and Barbara Durkatz, who didn't know about the protein yet, but they knew about this enzymatic reaction. And it published in Nature in 1980 that if you block this reaction with 3 amino benzamide, which happens to be a weak PARP inhibitor, you could kill more cells for your, you got more bang for your buck with your chemotherapy drug. 
Barbara then very wisely moved up to Newcastle at the same time as Hilary Calvert and Herbie Newell moved up there from the ICR and the Marsden to set up the second CRUK funded academic drug discovery unit and this was their first project so I put the timelines in here. So this was in 1990, they set up this project and Barbara had moved up and suggested PARP as a target. The other reason for showing you this is, this is chicken PARP because the enzyme had been, the protein had been characterized by then, and that's NAD binding. And it's this bit of NAD that binds in the binding pocket. And the reason for showing you this and the chemical structures, and I, my chemistry is weak, but my very good friend in the drug discovery team who sadly died of the disease that we're all trying to find treatments for, Roger Griffin, used to say to me, if you ever do a talk without a structure in it, it's boring. You've got to have structures. So these are structures. And the reason for showing you them is if you notice that blue bit there, that's three amino benzamide that Barbara used. And that is largely preserved across the series we made. These were initially Newcastle University compounds. We then got an academic partner, Agar and Pharmaceuticals, who did some of the very clever structural biology. And the drugs are getting more potent. And by 2003, we had a drug we could take into the clinic and CRUK sponsored a trial. I'd been working on this project since about 96 as a trainee and had designed a par passe and this showed, in the first trial, showed that we had a drug that hit its target, and we also started to see responses. So this is um, inhibition in PARP in a tumour. So these patients, as well as blood tests, very generously allowed us to have paired tumour biopsies. So in this patient at 4 milligrams, his PARP was 80% inhibited in his tumour where we wanted to deliver the drug. So we knew we had delivery. And the degree of inhibition went up. The error bars appear because we had more than one patient. It was only one patient. He is a patient from Belfast who, again, is still alive. We were seeing responses. This is the trial I offered to Peter, and he was the second patient in the world ever to get a PARP inhibitor. I don't know why, but his tumour started to respond. And after 20 cycles, when it had stopped getting smaller, I suggested to him he had a surgical resection of his tumour. While we were doing this, the scientists were continuing working, both at the ICR, where there's expertise in drug, um, DNA repair, and in Newcastle, collaborating with Sheffield, they showed that in very specific cells with BRCA defects, you could see responses without causing any DNA damage. And that's because BRCA1 and BRCA2 proteins sit in DNA repair pathways of double strand breaks. And this is synthetic lethality. If you knock out two pathways at once in a cell, it can't cope. Within six weeks of these paired nature papers coming out, I'd gone back to CRUK. You can write a trial um, grant request very quickly when you can see the opportunity. And they also funded Yvette on a, a PhD, and she still works with me as, as one of the phase one team now as an established consultant up in Newcastle. We opened this study, and the second patient again that we treated responded, so this clearly was going to work. This has become very topical because Angelina Jolie and Piers Brosnan's wife and daughter have BRCA defects. So this is very much in the public domain, um, you know, an interest on. So what happens also in academic drug discovery is you have to work with colleagues in pharma. This is very expensive to do. Most academic institutions couldn't afford to fund a clinical trial. Pfizer had acquired Agaron early in the development of um, Rucaparib. They also had acquired an enormous pipeline and deprioritized and made the decision to deprioritize this drug. But their senior medic said to me, if you write me a killer trial, one more trial will let you have drug. And a friend of ours from medical school, who was in Glasgow and is now back in London, Ian McNeish, and I wrote a study, which we took to CRUK for peer review. As we said, it'll be wider than BRCA, and this is the killer trial we think you should do. At the same time, Pfizer were looking to outlicense some of their deprioritized assets, and this trial we'd written and got peer-reviewed and funded somehow got into the mix. And Rucaparib was taken on by Clovis Oncology, and to be fair to them as a small company, they came straight to Ian and I and said, that's a smart idea, you can still do your trial and we'll supply drug. They then asked to meet us about a month later, in a very, they took us out for dinner in a really nice Indian restaurant just around the corner from the Royal College, and said, it is a smart idea, we're going to do the study, but one of you two can be the chief investigator. And so Ian is chief investigator on this study and presented it, and this is just a waterfall plot on Aerial 2. And this, in cancer medicine, if you, start, if you measure all your tumour and start at zero, if it grows, 
that's a bad thing, and it goes up. And if you get a waterfall, that's a good thing. 82% of the patients responded, and you're seeing some complete responses. And these are treatments of patients with metastatic cancer and a BRCA defect, either in the tumour or in the, um, in the germline. These data, the FDA liked this and gave... Rucapri was the first PARP inhibitor to get a breakthrough designation on the back of that and fast-tracked to registration and was approved in the States in December 2016. And the initial licence is in the BRCA germline. So this is a clinical development success story. It's a little bit frustrating. We had to do a new phase one when we went from IV to oral. We do have that clinical pharmacology expertise, so Newcastle was able to do that. But the phase three study last June was strongly positive. And in February this year, Newcastle University asked if I would hold an event, uh, I would organise, I missed a meeting and discovered I was organising an event, is actually what did happen, to celebrate this, which we held in the Great North Museum. And what was lovely for me is, although I no longer see him in clinic, I wrote to Peter and his wife and said, would you like to hear the end of the story? Because we're doing part of this as public engagement. And the European licence was granted on the 23rd of March. So... This, for me, I mean, it has been a journey, and I want to acknowledge the whole team, the most important being those patients who believe in us and are prepared to take a chance, and the research nurses who keep me right. The whole of the team in Newcastle who've done this at CRUK, the Centre for Drug Development, colleagues and friends now in a number of companies and collaborators and the clinical investigators. It's been traditional here. People have been thanking their families. And Chris Nutting said to me, you have to embarrass your daughter if she came here, because I am very grateful that Ed Emily was prepared to get up early and come down. And it drives everybody in the lab mad that the assay I developed has this really long incubation in the middle, which was absolutely ideal if you were going to be late for nursery, you wanted to do dinner and go back and then process your cells. And thank you for listening. Thank you.